Hey, Hill Squad, do you know that 50% of kids today have some kind of chronic disease? That number used to be 5% some 30 or 40 years ago. Very startling. If you want to know more about that and what we can do to affect that, you're going to love today's interview. Hey, everybody. Well, hey, Heel Squad Maria Menounos fans. Well, I don't mean to disappoint you. It's not Maria Menounos. It's Mr. Maria Menounos. Sitting here for my beautiful and talented wife. Today we have a very important discussion with a pediat- uh, integrative pediatric doctor. Um, whether you're a parent out there, uh, a grandparent, uh, or friends with someone who's a parent or want to be parent, I, I'm, I'm hoping... Uh, on a selfish level, I get great information from my daughter, uh, Natasha, uh, my friend in uh, Pharma, Heel Squad producer, sitting in. Thank you very much, Nat, who also is mom to Dylan, who's seven. So we're going to have a nice one two punch with uh, Dr. Joel Gator, our guest today, uh, Dr. Joel Gator Warsh. But before that, I do want to give the quote of the day uh, by loving them. More for their abilities, we show our children that they are much more than the sum of their accomplishments. Eileen Kennedy Moore. And man, that really is something to sit with because I do feel, uh, yeah, we definitely are way too much into accomplishments and outcomes rather than the journey getting there and certainly our abilities. But that being said, uh, Dr. Joel Gator Warsh is a board-certified pediatrician in Los Angeles who specializes in parenting, wellness, and inter- <laughs> integrative medicine. He's the author of the upcoming book, Parenting at Your Child's Pace, the uh, Integrative Pediatrician's Guide for to the First Three Years, which is why, you know, I have him on today for me. Uh, Dr. Gator is known for his popular Instagram, at Dr. Joel Gator, where he offers weekly parenting and integrative pediatric support. Uh Dr. Joel, um, thank you so much for sitting in with us today and um, having this very important conversation. I, I, I want to even just start with something I saw on your Instagram that really moved me was the fact that, and this is, you, you, were, you were referencing a study, 50% of kids today have chronic diseases. What was it? What was it like 30 years ago? It was about 5 to 10%, uh, you know, back you know, 50 years ago or so. So I don't know exactly 30, probably was like 10% in that range, but it's nowhere near 40 or 50% like we're seeing with the statistics these days. What would you, what would, in your experience, what would you attribute it to? I think the two biggest factors are our food is not what it used to be. We're not getting the nutrients that we need and we're exposed to too many toxins. There's just more and more toxins. They're all combining and affecting us in ways that we just don't understand. And that you add to that, the food that we're getting, it's processed. We're eating a ton of sugar. There's a lot of chemicals and dyes in all of our food. And also things are mass produced and we're not getting local produce anymore. Or very rarely we're getting those kinds of things. So we're not getting the nutrients that we need for our bodies to function. Wow, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, and, and I think that we, you know, one of the things we go over on the show is, you know, the, the blue screen, mm-hmm. right? The toxicity of the, mm-hmm. of the, all the TV and iPad, iPhone and, do, do, you, do you see a correlation there as well? I think so. I, there, there's no simple answer to what's going on. I think there are so many factors that are affecting our health, but certainly, especially when it comes to mental health, I mean, we have a mental health disaster and a crisis, and I think the screens are a huge factor in that, um, especially with the light. It's affecting our sleep. But with teens, you know, 50% of teenagers at 18 now have a mental health diagnosis. Teens are on screens for seven to nine hours a day on average. And to me, I'm not saying that screens are the boogeyman or you can't watch a screen, you can't do your homework on a screen. But if you're on, you know, watching TV on the computer for seven to nine hours a day, what are you not doing? You're not getting out into nature. You're not spending time um, with your family. You're not spending time cooking. You're not spending time walking around. I mean, these are the things that we're missing. And if we're not doing those you know, if we're not exposed to those vital aspects of our health and our world, then it's not a surprise to me that we're, we're seeing all these conditions. You know, I remember there was an ad campaign in the seventies about TV. It was like treat TV with tender, loving care. And it was, 
the the message was you know watch TV with your children and you know moderate it, mitigate it. And I feel you know that it's you know, when someone disappears for seven to nine hours, that's crazy. I think so, and and you know it's not all doom and gloom. I just think it's important that we start to recognize what's going on so that we can move in a different direction because not everything is bad. I mean, if you look at how long people lived under 200 years ago, you know, you'd live to 40 or 50 as the average age. Now we're living to 70, but the life expectancy is going back down and chronic disease is going back up. So I think we need to be mindful to look at, okay, what, what are we doing better and what can we do to make some small changes to move back into a better direction? And it, it's not that complicated to think about the foundations of our health. And it's not that complicated to get back to the basics and cook a little bit more, try to get a little bit more fresh food, try to get outside a little bit more. We just don't think about these things enough because we're, we've been marketed to for so many years, I think. And we're, we're just so used to convenience and, and that can be good sometimes, but there's something that we lose for convenience and often that's our health. Okay. So backing up a little bit, and I was even having a hard time with integrative medicine. <laughs> Tell me what that is, because you're not usually just here. Oh, he's a pedi- she or she mm-hmm. or they or a pediatrician. What is integrative medicine? So to me, it means blending the best of modern medicine with alternative and holistic practices. So I did all the regular pediatrics training. I trained at a great Western program, but over time, I got a little bit frustrated with the regular system. Uh, medicine was seems to really be focused on on treatment. So you have some sort of condition, here's the pill for that. But there wasn't a lot of discussion on prevention, not a lot of discussion on our diet or sleep or exercise. And and really, when you hear the word integrative, you know, you think of something woo-woo and out there. But I was seeing patients, friends, family members go to natural practitioners and get better from things that they had been diagnosed maybe for life from medicine, and they would go and get better. And so that really opened up my mind to start thinking, hmm, you know, maybe there's something to this alternative medicine. And my wife is pretty holistic minded. So those two things together kind of push me to start learning about this. So then I mean your wife lists herself as a holistic divorce lawyer. attorney. <laughs> she is, yeah. Yeah. I find that amazing. <laughs> and my goodness, I think I, I should have met her. <laughs> right. I think there's a conversation to be had with her, but I just love the idea of adding the word holistic to, you know, I think so because applying it, that right because it's really about the whole person right when she you know, goes through and works with clients on divorce then she's really thinking about the whole person trying to help them you know she used to be a yoga instructor and so she's kind of blended those two worlds together and for me yeah you know, I I didn't grow up as a really integrative minded person but I I think it just makes sense and there's no real reason to me to shun integrative medicine or holistic medicine. There's no reason why we can't bring the best of both worlds together and, and think about diet, think about exercise, use supplements when it's appropriate, uh, send our patients to practitioners that, that work in the alternative world if it makes sense. And there's no better example than acupuncture, right? Acupuncture used to be quite woo-woo maybe 20, 30 years ago, but now after the opioid epidemic, we, we realized that we don't want to be giving these medications to everybody, and so we were looking for alternative solutions, and acupuncture is a great solution for pain. And now in almost every hospital, you can see acupuncture. So it's not something that's woo-woo. It's just been integrated into modern medicine, and I think we need to do that with so many other alternative practices and continue to study it and, and bring in the research and the data so we can make informed choices. We don't want to just do anything willy-nilly. We want to have good research and data, but there's no reason to look the other way on some of these things. I think they can be really helpful. I agree. I mean, this is what our show is all about. Um, let's, let's talk about the book, Parenting at Your Child's Pace. Just already the title I'm in, but can you can you expand on that a little bit? So the The reason behind the title was I really feel like these days we're comparing ourselves to other people more than ever. And I feel like it used to be, to some degree easier to be a parent because you just had your grandparents around, maybe some cousins, and you can kind of discuss things with them and then figure figure something out. But now with social media, you're comparing to everybody else, all the, you know, air quotes gurus out there, all your your friends, the influencers, and, and what everybody says you should be doing. And so there's so much noise and it makes it really difficult to know what you should do for your own child. And and that increases the stress that I'm seeing in parents. I feel like parents are more stressed than ever when I'm seeing in the office these days, even though we have more information, more access to information, we have better safety standards than we ever had before. You know, we used to 
um, not have safety standards on toys. We didn't have seatbelts. We had lead in paint. We had mercury and, and cocaine in our regular foods and drinks, right? Well, we've come a long way in terms of safety, and yet we feel like we're less prepared than ever. At least that's how I, I feel like parents um, are, are, are feeling and thinking these days, and I, I'm seeing it as we go that parents just don't trust in their own inner abilities and, and know what is best for their child, even though they do. I, I think we do know what's best for our child most of the time, and we need to trust ourselves a little bit more. But if we're comparing ourselves to everybody else, especially to social media, which is often not even real, then... <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I had a great one celebrity tell me the reason to have children is he said to me, uh, they're the only thing that is real. The news is mm -hmm. fake. Everyone's life on Instagram and Facebook is fake. He's like, the only thing is real are your kids. Definitely. And so you're right. But when we're <laughs> guided by all this, by comparison... Mm -hmm. and what we're seeing and i get it's I, yeah i think people are more scared and it goes back to marketing mm -hmm. you know i the, with the news if it bleeds it leads right so we know that we know this so that's the only thing that's going to get ratings is fear mm -hmm. and scary stuff and uh that's the only thing that's going to you know it's going to initiate a purchase so yeah i feel like so I'm, i see maria my wife falls into it she's so nervous about so many things and um i'm afraid can that come out on a child i think it parents can. nervousness definitely i think that is a huge factor in some of the the mental health crisis that we're seeing and in our health crisis we, we know based on research and data that if you are more stressed you're more likely to get sick they've done they did studies on that 50 years ago 100 years ago you'd have two three times the risk of, of getting sick they were sticking viruses in people's noses and looking at who was stress versus not stressed and and the people that self-reported they were stressed have a much higher risk of getting sick i don't know who was volunteering for these studies <laughs> hope they paid them well yeah. but you know we, we we know this and it's it's i think it's almost common sense like if you're stressed it's affecting your hormones it's affecting your immune system and it's yeah. going to make you more likely to get sick and if you're constantly stressed that's going to affect you but it's also going to affect your child because it's a constant circular uh, relationship with you and your child. And if they're always seeing you nervous, then that's going to come off on them. And, and I, I think that's a really important thing to be mindful of. And that's where we just have to step back and, and recognize that some of these things are just not great for our health. And maybe we have to step back from social media a little bit. Maybe we mm -hmm. have to curate our feed a little bit because not all of social media is bad. It's just what it's become, I think, that's bad and, and the algorithms and how we've built sometimes our world in social media around the things that are divisive or fear-based but it doesn't have to be you can have a, a, a instagram feed with puppies and architecture and food you can yes <laughs> you can mute those other things and um you can yeah the more you're following aspirational inspirational educational but like we said not to the extreme of education where you're scared by everything mm -hmm. i know um you know, you're you are a doctor who has however many years of medical school and training. What you all go through? Too many, right? <laughs> Too many. It's a lot. And then the amount of hours you have to put in. You know, I I summer is here, Heal Squad, and to make sure we're all set for our upcoming summer travels, we will be heading over to Macy's to make sure we have everything we need. If you're ready to start planning for that upcoming summer vacation and you need some inspiration on where to start, make sure you head over to Maria's Macy's Wishlist using the link in this episode description. Let us know what you end up with. Wonderful pistachios. If you're a fan of the show, you know that for Maria and I, this is literally our go-to snack and the go-to snack of our loved ones. Uh, whether you like the salt and vinegar like I do or the chili like Maria does, or the plain, like uh, my father-in-law likes, um, with wonderful pistachios. Uh, it's a great snack. It's something great and easy to eat on the go. Each one-ounce serving has 6 grams of protein, giving you over 10% of your daily value. So if you've been looking for the perfect snack, you can thank us later. Head over to www.wonderfulpistachios.com. Even Bobo wants some pistachios to snag a bag or... A bunch of bags, as we do. And by the way, may I recommend the little snack pack? Buying that in bulk. Now you get something you could just throw in your backpack, put in your pocket, or just do a, uh, the Munch and Go program. Okay, Bobo, let's go get some pistachios. I've seen in your stuff there's frustration with a lot of the TikTok experts. <laughs> 
right, and stuff that they put out there that isn't, let's say, fully accurate. Yeah, which, I mean, I think people should be able to put out whatever content that they want, but what to me is frustrating is that there are so many people that are not educated on the things that they're saying, and there's nothing to combat that because a lot of the people that are you know, very educated on, on some of these topics either don't speak out or, or don't necessarily have the following to be able to combat it. And so you hear a lot of the influencers a lot more than the, the professionals. And so I think that we need that, that counterbalance to really help drive drive the picture. Because sometimes it's good to know things. I mean, I, again, I'm not against people Googling, right? I, people say that to me all the time. Like, are you against parents Googling? No, I think it's good. It's good to be aware. You must do. I mean, I know a lot of doctors now, what they'll say to us is, uh, okay, you've been to Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. And I, th I think that's the wrong attitude to have because I think it is okay to be informed. I think the thing that parents need to understand is how to Google appropriately and to understand what we are looking at. Because if you go in with the mindset that you're looking and it's going to give you the answer, then it's going to make you stress because most things take you down a path. Almost every single symptom that you have, you know, if, you're, if your child has gas, you can go look online and you're going to see all the worst stuff because everything has those minor symptoms with it. But if you understand that you take in the picture, that there are a lot of things that a professional is looking at when they're, when they're making a diagnosis, then you can go in gathering the information and then asking questions as opposed to it making you stressed out, which I feel like a lot of people are doing these days. They Google something, they see gas, and then it leads them to celiac disease or cancer mm -hmm. or whatever, but they don't realize that there's no bleeding. There's no severe stomach ache. It hasn't been going on for a long time. They don't have a fever. Like these are the questions that we ask or with developmental milestones, their child is 11 months and, and or let's say 13 months and not walking. And the average age for walking or first steps is 12 months. And they get nervous because they feel like their child's behind and there must be something that they're doing wrong. Even though 50% of kids are walking at 12 months means 50% of kids are not. And if they are doing everything else on schedule, then maybe they're just going to walk it 14 months, and that's totally okay. And that's that's <laughs> the book, Parenting at Your Church, part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that as well. I, you know, my mom is always like, is Athena walking? Is, and I said, no, she's crawling. Mm -hmm. And I actually heard, I heard this from someone else. I don't know if it's true. But they were saying the longer the baby crawls, the more athletically inclined they become later in life. Don't know if that's true or not, but... I like the idea of not rushing them in the process. I don't see the need. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that I just don't see the need to rush kids. I think sometimes we gain some validation from our kids in terms of the fact that we must be a great parent because our kid's walking early or talking early. And, and that's that's not true. It's not going to be the difference in them getting into a great university or not. They're not going to Harvard because they talked at 11 months or versus 14 months. It doesn't make any difference, I, I don't think. I think it's more we want to help them and guide them at whatever pace is right for them. And pushing them too much is also not a great thing. So it's a balance between being there and providing appropriate boundaries and, and helping them to succeed versus gaining our validation from our child who's at 11 months who's talking versus the other friend who's not. Like there, that doesn't really matter that much as long as everything else is going well. Go ahead, Nat. Were you going to say something? I was going to ask, when do you... when? It, as a parent, should you be concerned that your child isn't on par with the rest of the children? All right, great question. So for each milestone, that's a little bit different. And that's where the milestones can be helpful. It's not that we shouldn't be aware of what the average is. I think it's good to have a general idea because sometimes there there is an issue, right? And sometimes your child, let's say walking or talking, if they're two years old and these are not happening, then it, it is reasonable to seek out guidance and assistance from others. And, and if there are multiple things that you're worried about, like we're we haven't crawled and we are sick all the time and we're not walking. <laughs> Please continue. No problem. Uh, so sometimes when a child is, is not walking and not talking and they haven't crawled before and they aren't doing some of the things that we would expect and they seem like they have generalized muscle weakness, they're sick all the time, there's a bigger picture there. And that's usually when we're worried. But one skill here or there are we worried about? No, and I get it all the time. A parent reads a book on developmental milestones and they look at how many blocks their child should be stacking at a certain age. And they're like, my child can't do that. They can't stack 10 blocks. I'm like, well, have you tried? Do you have 10 blocks? Have you done it? They're like, no, we never really <laughs> tried. They're like, well, that's probably why they can't do it. It doesn't mean just because the book says your kid at you know 15 months should stack this many blocks that there's an issue. Like every kid is different and also some things... It matters how much you work on it, how much you practice it, but just because your child can do it a little bit earlier 
doesn't make them more prepared for the world. I know food's a big part of what you, you know, what you preach. Can you get into a little bit of that? Yeah, I I think of anything that I talk about, food is is the most important just because in general, even in the best case scenario, our food is not that great these days. I mean, if you think about just a, a berry, you know, on a plant, if you go pick it, if you have a garden, how many days does it last for? You know, maybe two, maybe three, five, if you're lucky. But if we go to a grocery store, how old is all of that food? Even the best case scenario, right? I mean, we picked it off a plant, maybe in some other country, then it got shipped in a you know a truck or whatever, however it got here. Then it went to some department store or depart you know central location. Then it got shipped to the store. Then it sat there for a couple of days. Then you ate it. So that means there's something that they must be doing to you know either ripening it or preserving it. So we're not getting things at their most natural state, at their most nutrient dense. And so to me, that's still almost the best case scenario for most people because we're getting things that are in boxes that have preservatives that have chemicals and dyes. And so. I just want to speak to focusing people back to how important food is, how important cooking is, and how important it is that we get back to the basics and try to go to farmer's markets if we can, try to get to know our farmers as much as we can, but at least be mindful and move the needle a little bit from wherever you are. So that doesn't mean you have to go from eating a bag of chips to eating broccoli, but it does mean that maybe we can flip over the bag of chips, look at the two bag of chips on the on the shelf and figure out which one has better ingredients and then buy that one. And each little, each little step helps for our kids. And we can all read labels. You don't need to have a PhD to know that some word on the label is not good for you. If you don't know what it is, it's probably not good for you. If you know it's you know, apple and raisin and whatever, then that's going to get you a lot farther along than a long chemically name. You don't know what it is and just start doing that. And each little thing makes a difference over 10 years or five years. I think you're onto something too with the, I think almost, I mean, it might be an arrogant when I think everyone has a farmer's market today, Natasha. Is it just, I mean, Los Angeles? I mean, Los Angeles, they're <laughs> very dense. There's farmer's markets all the time. Yeah, but they're, they're getting more popular. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and if you live in more rural places, then you might be more, you know, closer to farm, but not everywhere has it for sure. And certainly not everybody has access. So, yeah. So when you don't, I mean, is, is it just whole, whole, not just, is it Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and those places that? Yeah. I mean, so that, I think that's an issue. I mean, there, there's two issues. There's your family issue and there's a society issue. And, and I try to focus on the family because we're not necessarily going to change society today. You can't necessarily change all of the food, but you can choose where you go to some degree. So if those are options for you, then I think that's a great thing to do. Uh, but if it's not, then you know, if you're cooking one meal a day, well, let's work on cooking two meals a day. If you're buying um, bags of chips, and let's buy some better bags of chips. Each each little thing helps because as we're seeing and as we, we started talking about today, the, the chronic disease rate is skyrocketing. And if we keep living in the same way that we're living, then we're going to get sicker and sicker. And, and everybody can do whatever they want, but I don't want kids to be sick. I don't want my children to be sick. I don't want your children to be sick. And so we have to do something different if we want a different outcome. I had heard this startling, mm -hmm. not statistic, but someone had said to me that the, a lot of the diseases our grandparents died of at the end of their life, kids are now having at the beginning of their life because of all the processed foods. And it's like so many generations of the processed foods foods that we've had. Yeah. I mean, they're nearly every chronic condition is skyrocketing compared to what it used to be. But maybe the best example is diabetes, type 2 diabetes. I mean, it is literally called adult onset diabetes because it was something that you did not see in kids 50 years ago or, or more. I mean, I, I did a talk on diabetes a few months ago, and I was trying to look into the statistics on it to compare you know, where we are today versus where we were back then. And I couldn't even find data on type 2 diabetes from over 50 years ago on kids. It just says, oh, you know, there, there wasn't really data on it. Maybe there were a few cases, but it wasn't very common. And now you know, diabetes and prediabetes, we're, we're seeing, you know, 30% or more kids have diabetes or prediabetes. The average age of onset is, is 13. And these are things that we just never saw before. I mean, cancer rates are skyrocketing in younger younger kids and younger adults, um, asthma, allergies, all these things that they were around for the most part, but they were not nearly as prevalent as they are today. And 
that should be something that we should be paying attention to and trying to figure out, okay, this is happening. Why? Why is it happening? Not to blame anything, not to blame anyone, not to blame ourselves. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, that's not going to get us anywhere. Right. And, and I think that's a big issue that we're having today is we don't want to blame or shame anybody. We don't want to make it so that a parent feels like they did something wrong. But that's not the right mentality to have. I think we need to be thinking, well, this is happening. So let's figure out why. So that way we can help our kids be as healthy right. as possible. We do the best that we can with what we know. And we want to get new information so that we can do things differently and better. And the world is changing very quickly. And things are very different than when our parents were growing up and their parents were growing up. And so we just need to be mindful of what is actually happening today and then make some changes for our, our children's health. Because most people don't focus on health. They focus on money and time. It's money. <laughs> yes, right. No, we, this is our whole, my wife's show, Heal Squad. It's all, <laughs> that premise is people only care about health when it's gone. Right. And it's too, it's too late. I mean, we, our health is gone. You know, and I think that's what we need to, to, to understand is we're now at a point where our kids are sick. Like this is happening. We are here. And whether it's a mental health diagnosis or a chronic disease, the majority of people ha are taking medication. The majority of kids are going to have a chronic disease if they don't already. So we cannot wait anymore. We have to make changes and we can't wait for the medical system to change because the medical system is very slow and there's a, you know, a lot of bureaucracy there and, and there's only so much time that a doctor can spend with you. So it is up to the parent, I think, and the family to be mindful of this and do whatever you can. Not to be talking about doom and gloom. It's not doom and gloom because there are so many little things that we can do and it makes a huge difference and we can um, protect our family and create the most resilience that we possibly can to help them to thrive. And, and I think, and I know that we can do it because I see it in the office all the time. You know, my, my wife's father, uh, Costas, is type 1 diabetes of now 60 years. And MIT has asked us probably once every couple of years, can we study his body? Because he's 80, still climbs ladders, still carries beams, builds all these great structures. I mean, he's a marvel. And the one thing, you know, they didn't have much education around it when he was diagnosed, but they just said to him, you have to avoid sugar, and you know there are certain foods that will turn into sugar, breads, things like that. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Okay, I'm in." He's a very disciplined man. Uh, and by the way, it, without I don't want to be denigrating, but not not of means. Okay, I'll just say mm -hmm. that much. He did not have money, but he figured out that with fresh produce, uh, meats, and limiting everything, it, eliminating sugar. He's very strict about that but limiting uh, the bad carbs. Here he is now. I mean, there's like no loss of eyesight, no no loss of, of sensation in his limbs. And it's, it's incredible what he's been able to do. And to, well, I always go back to him and say, you know, that's proof. There was another guy named Jack LaLanne who lived to 100. Now, granted, he was around um, better. He wasn't around a lot of the toxicity we're talking about today or the bad food, but his, his diet and his movement um, I studied it because we wrote a, one of our books was on um, was on weight loss, and all of his principles were still sound. And he lived to about a hundred; like he was like mm -hmm. ninety seven, ninety eight. But I do think it all starts with what we put in our mouth. But now I do have think we have to consider. It's not enough just get an apple, or uh, right? You have to be thinking where did it come from, and you, you, you're right. Like how long is what preservatives are in there? What talk uh, pesticides, right? All well, that well, stuff. I, I think that's the best, right? I think that's the best case scenario. I don't think everybody is there yet and that's okay. But I think that if we start to be mindful of every single decision as it comes to our health, then we can move the needle forward, whatever that means for you. And for some people that might mean going to farmer's markets, getting to know farmers. Because if it it's available, If it's yeah. available, because it doesn't have to be more expensive. Right. You can cut out the middleman. You can find a farm, you know, nearby. They send boxes, you know, you can get things like that and it's not necessarily more expensive, but that's not where everybody is. But I do think that everybody can make some changes in their life, which don't have to be more expensive. It's just choosing between the better options or choosing to prioritize health. So therefore, 
we spend a little bit more time, if it's possible to cook a little bit more or to spend more time with our family and get everybody involved, what, whatever that means for you. No, I love that and get everyone involved in yeah. the process. And the other thing that you said, which you, you kind of glossed over, but I think is also super important for, for health is, you know, you're saying about your, your dad that he was you know building and working. And I think that's also the other half that matters, right? I mean, you yes. look at the blue zones and it's not people that are going to the gym all day, right? Like you watch... Uh, the grandmas, the great grandmas at like nine, you know, 105 or 98. They yep. have bigger muscles than me. And they're in the kitchen, you know, rolling and working. Yeah. And, and then the guy, you know, people are outside working at the farms. Like th- it's a lifestyle of movement. Movement and sunlight and, and, sunlight nature, and nature and all that stuff. And yes, and that this, this is something my father in law is so big into. He loves being outside. My, my wife does too. And I feel like um, w- our generation with cable TV. We started the whole, oh, let's turn the AC on and right. watch TV all day. And, and that's where like the true health doesn't cost anything, really. I mean, those are all the things where a lot of those individuals who are the healthiest, they don't have a lot of means. Right. right? They don't have a lot of means. It's just that they live a lifestyle that their day involves either farming or working and then and cooking. And and so they're they're moving all day. That's their life. They're not going to the gym. I mean, you can go to the gym if you want to. But if you are just moving all day because you have to walk up and down the hill, that's going to get that's you enough. so much farther. That's my father-in-law. That's what yeah, you need to he do. He doesn't lift any weights. <laughs> it's just move, move, move. Yeah, Always my, moving. My grandfather was a builder too, and he, he was extraordinarily healthy right up until he passed away. And he, you know, he was pretty elderly at that time. And, and it's because he worked all the time. He was still, I mean, my family, they were trying to get him to stop, but he was still climbing up on roofs in his 80s. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like things. And it's like... But but that's how you can be if that's what you're doing every day. If you're not using it, then then you're going to start running into issues as you as you get older. But if we want to live the healthiest that we can for the longest, it's it's. I don't think it's overly complicated. I think we overcomplicate it by trying to buy things and purchase things and supplement our way through things. And that's that's not really what you need to do. I mean, you can do those things, but at the end of the day, you can also just live a natural life where you cook a lot, you work, you your work is exercise, and you move around, and, and that will get you most of the way. And then you'll be imparting your kids with that wisdom, which hopefully then, then they will take that too and start to impart that on, onto their own lives. Well, Maria, because she grew up in that household, she never had sweets or processed foods or sodas. Mm-hmm. So her habits, I have to say, I, when we first started dating, I corrupted her a little mm-hmm. bit, but now she's gone back to um, eating that way. And I think is that, is it, it seems like it's important to kind of start them off on the right track without sugars, like mm-hmm. as as infants. Right. Heal Squad, that concludes part one of our interview with Dr. Joel Warsh. Tomorrow, we'll be back with part two, where we're going to dive a little deeper into what we can do actually with our children to make their lives longer and yours as well. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. Program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menunos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menunos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.